Yeah. All right, let's go for it here. All right, it's my pleasure uh, to introduce today's uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Michael Levin. Michael has a bachelor's in computer science, master's degrees in, uh, master degree and PhD degrees in civil engineering, all for the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, on another side, uh, he is an Eagle Scout and he's uh, certified to teach math to eighth through 12th graders, at least in Texas. And his research interests are pretty wide ranging. Uh, he looks into automated vehicles, he looks into air transport, and he's taken on one of the perennial hard problems in traffic engineering, which is managing a network of traffic signals in some sort of optimal manner. And so with that, I'll uh, turn it over to Michael. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, I think I've, so I've been here as an assistant professor um, for almost five years now. And I think many of you probably know uh, my work on automated vehicles, but I have also been studying quite in depth a new method of traffic signal timing. And I thought since uh, people have seen my automated vehicle work, I wanted to talk about this, which also probably has a lot more immediate ramifications for practice. Um, so with traffic signal timing, we're probably all familiar with the general problem where we can uh, we want to figure out the timings for traffic signals. And these intersections that are controlled by traffic signals are a major bottleneck for many urban networks. This is an image of where you can see the light is green, but yet no one is really able to move because the intersection is blocked. And this is a problem that happens and it just kind of illustrates how traffic signal timing is not necessarily an easy problem. Um, there are certain, standard ways of doing traffic signal timing many ways have been developed over the past in the past century um, but there recently has been a very new method of approaching this problem and that's what i've been building off of um, this method was first developed by tassilis and ephremides actually they work on internet packet routing not even traffic signals and in, in 1992 they had a paper where they tried to get packets you know that we use to communicate with google and other websites through the router network with uh, as maximum throughput as possible. You want to get as much as, as many packets served as possible, which you can imagine is great for internet speeds. Um, in 2013, Provin Varai at UC Berkeley noticed this could be applied to traffic signal timing. And that is kind of the basis of all of this work that I've been talking about now. Um, it's called max pressure signal control, um, or sometimes called back pressure, because what it comes down to is this interesting objective function, um, where you see we want to maximize this term. This term is SIJ is a signal timing, either zero or one for red light, green light, Q is capacity, WIJ is a weight function, which I'll explain shortly. Um, and it's not immediately obvious why this is even a good idea or why this is useful. And the nice thing about this is that this control is very, very simple to calculate. Um, in fact, you can even calculate it individual intersections separately without ha really having to do any coordination. But the analytical properties are what makes this really valuable. And that's what I want to get into today, as well as talking about how to make this usable in practice or some of the work I've been doing there. This weight function um, that we have here is the main control part. And this weight function is determined as the um, Q length on link I to J minus the Q length on link J to K. So what it's just saying is that, let's look at the vehicles that are on the link I waiting to turn to link J. And then that's going to increase the weight. Any vehicles on link J that are going to turn to link K, that's going to decrease the weight. So in other words, we want to move vehicles from long queues to short queues. If the queue, if the downstream queue is long, it's not very helpful. Um, here's kind of an illustration of what that the, what that looks like here um, with more detail. So here we have our equations that we're trying to maximize in the weight function again. And here's an illustration of what the intersection might look like. Now on this road, I have drawn two vehicles. And so the queue on this road is two. This road, I've drawn the other two vehicles. There's also a queue on this road that's two. And because there's a, two, a queue of two here and a queue of two here, the weight going across this or the pressure is zero because you're trying to move vehicles from a long queue to a long queue. On the other hand, we have this orange link where there's only one vehicle here. So the queue here is one, but there are zero vehicles here. So the queue here is zero. And we're, therefore we have a pressure of one. And so the optimal phase as specified as max pressure control would be to move the, or, or give a green light to this orange vehicle. Um, so that's kind of the general idea. As you can see, it's very simple to calculate. Now what I want to talk about is why this is useful. 
So the main goal of this is to get a control that's easy to compute. And by easy to compute, I mean it's decentralized, meaning that if I want to calculate the optimal phase at uh, one uh, for all the intersections, I can actually do it intersection by intersection, only look at a single intersection at a time during that computation. Second, and probably the most interesting property is that we can prove that this will maximize the throughput of the overall city, how many vehicles can get through the network. Um, and that's going to take a lot more explanation. Um, but the idea is that we can get maximum throughput both at this intersection level, but also at the city if, if we have a network of intersections con controlled like this. And the way we prove this is using a Markov chain model. Um, this model describes the movement of vehicles through a network, but the model um, includes stochasticity based on vehicle randomness. There are two parts of random, uh, two random things that might happen. Vehicles have different turning proportions where we can get average turning proportions, but for any time step, we'll see the turning proportions are going to be random. Second, the demand is going to be random where we can get average demands, but um, if we look at number of vehicles entering the network from like a neighborhood, from a parking lot, it's random. It's not going to be constant over time. Um, and what we want to do is define some set of demands, capital D. Um, and there's a set, the set of demands is actually a very special property because it's a set of demand that can be served by any traffic signal control. So this gets into how we prove throughput. We can obviously create a network, even just a single intersection where the demand is so large, it's going to exceed the capacity. No matter what signal time you give it, we're always going to um, be unable to serve everyone. So what we really care about is the set of demands that we can serve. And I want to prove that this particular max pressure signal timing will serve as much demand as that can be served by any other signal control. And that leads to theorem one, which says that if my average demand is not in this set D, then I can't serve it. And if the average demand is in the set D, then the max pressure control will serve that demand. So in other words, I can serve as much demand as any other a, a, a traffic signal control. Now, when we talk about traffic signal on networks, I want to just kind of give an illustration of what this looks like, where I've taken a picture of a um, road network where there's various um, uh, city, uh, city blocks, different buildings, and kind of decompose that into what we might look at in terms of a traffic network. So these, inter these nodes here, the circles, are the intersections for major roads. I haven't looked, done all of the roads and it's not usually done, uh, we usually don't do this for all the major roads. And the links here, the connections between two nodes are connecting the uh, intersections. Um, so you can see that this diagonal road is comprised of several links that are, uh, that are separated by intersections. The arrows indicate which direction you can go on these. So I wanna get a little bit more into the details of how we are able to accomplish this maximum throughput. And this involves creating a Markov chain queuing model. The queuing model is the number of vehicles on a link waiting to turn to the downstream link. So we've kind of seen this pressure function before, but now this gets into the math of how this was derived. So we have this uh, link queues, X, I, J, F, T, and a Markov chain says, how do we go from the queue at time T to the queue at time T plus one? And we can do that by looking at a simple conservation law. The queue at time to go from time t to time t plus one we look at the vehicles that exited subtract those and add the vehicles that entered that entering vehicles come from some link k into link i multiplied by trend proportions how many vehicles are going from i to j um, we have a similar equation for vehicles entering the network from like a parking lot except entering flow is now demand rather than um ra ra rather than um, drivers from preceding links um, and this Y is determined by um, how many vehicles are on the queue, but it, it's also limited by the signal control and the capacity. So if the signal is red, this will be zero, and so no vehicles will move. If the signal is green, this is one, and so up to capacity vehicles can move. So looking at this queuing model, um, I just want to kind of illustrate the difference here where X, the X variables indicate the vehicles that are in the queue and a Y indicates the vehicles that are moving across the intersection. So now we can get to the main results here, um, achieving maximum throughput. And this is really cool because the, um, it's not intuitive that this would actually be equivalent to throughput. But first we define something called stability. The network is stable if the long run average queue lengths are bounded. 
And that, if you know Markov chains, this is kind of it looks very similar to positive recurrence of Markov chains, because if we are, um, if the Q length grows to infinity, we're essentially leaving the um, recurrent set. Um, the, but this is actually equivalent to maximum throughput, because if we look at the total number of vehicles in the network, well, that number of vehicles is going to increase as vehicles enter the network and decrease as vehicles exit. So in other words, if there are vehicles entering at a higher rate than vehicles are exiting, this number, the key average Q length, will grow to infinity. So, so saying that this average Q length is bounded is equivalent to saying that vehicles enter the network at the same rate as which they exit the network. Or in other words, vehicles that are entering the network are exiting in a timely fashion and therefore achieving um, throughput. Everyone's getting served. Or throughput is equal to demand. Now, Trying to prove the stability is actually quite complicated and leads to, uh, uh, if you look at the papers, it, it, it involves a very complicated proof, which I'm not going to go through here, but I do want to summarize kind of the main result of this. Um, the, and the main result is that we use a Lyapunov value function. This value function is something that's always greater than or equal to zero. And we want to show that if I look at this function from um, time t plus one, from time t to time t plus one, that will be bounded by some constant minus epsilon times the q length. And if I can show that, then we end up with a statement that the um, number that we, we can show equivalently that the number of vehicles in the network, the average um, total number of vehicles is bounded by this kappa over epsilon where these were the kappa and epsilon here in that Lapno value function. It's kind of algebraic. It's not too hard to show, um, to go from here to here. Showing this result, that's the hard part. And that, that usually involves kind of some uh, detailed analysis of, of how do we get this epsilon into this equation. And that the basic intuition is that using a certain signal timing, the Qs will on average decrease by epsilon if we are providing a slightly more capacity at least than the amount of demand for each intersection. And we can prove that by doing some algebra and some um, optimization problems to show that the max pressure control um, will actually be sufficient to satisfy this condition. Um, so in terms of proving stability, I wanna go just kind of like a little bit deeper in how I did that, which is, First, we have to define the stable region, the set of demand. And it's important to define this demand because as I said before, any demand that's not in the stable region, we need to show that it can't be served by any other signal control. And we want to show that the max pressure control can serve any demand in the stable region. So to do this, we define some equations that describe the stable region, nothing too surprising. It's more just looking at the average flows and the average capacity given to those flows. And when we can prove that, um, if, if the demand is, is not in the stable region, then no signal timing can serve it. If the demand is in the stable region, the max pressure signal timing can serve it. And we can prove that it can serve it using the Lyapunov function from previous slide. And that gives us the maximum throughput. In other words, it can serve any demand that can be served by any other signal timing. Um, and then looking at this control again, it has a really nice decentralized property where at each time step, we want to choose the phases that maximize this objective function. Notice I'm taking the sum over all of the links here, all of the different roads, and trying to do the signal timing for each road. So essentially, I'm writing a, a, an objective function that is describing the signal control for the entire city. Um, however, it's separable by intersection. I can, instead of writing sum over ij, I can take the sum over n and then look at the sum of all the roads coming up to some intersection n and then write the same objective. And actually what we, the way, because of the Markov property and how vehicles move through the network, the different intersections won't affect each other for the same time step. They'll affect each other at future time steps. We only look one time step at a time due to the Markov property. And so I can look the solution at some intersection and it doesn't affect the solution at other intersections, which means I can solve this part of the problem by brute force enumeration at each intersection. It's very fast, just loop through all the phases, which is like eight or so. Um, so very easy to compute. Um, parallel processing is possible. Now, this is kind of an introdu introduction of what Varaya came up with. What I want to do is talk about what I've been doing to extend this, which is several properties. And the first things are looking at some practical issues associated with this max pressure control. Um, some of these practical issues involve just how this is formulated. So with max pressure control, we end up with this arbitrary phase ordering, meaning that 
at each time step, I'm trying to just simply choose the phase that maximizes the objective. Well, that could be the same phase for 10 minutes in a row, or it could be it could be the same phase for an hour in a row, depending on how the demand works. And obviously, if you are a driver, you don't want to be waiting at a signal for 10 minutes or an hour. So that's kind of a problem. And um, another related problem is that we can switch phases or jump between phases of that order. So a lot of drivers watching this may be very confused about why they aren't getting a green light for 10 minutes while other approaches are getting a green light. So that's kind of a practical issue. I mean, in terms of the mathematical engineering objective, maybe we don't care about it, but in terms of putting this onto actual roads, we should. Um, there's, and related to that, there's no maximum waiting time, meaning that you can imagine vehicles at a low demand approach might have very little pressure and so we might end up waiting a very long time to get a green light. Um, signal coordination is something that we like to have um, where, where if I catch a green light, I want to catch more green lights along the same road. That's something that is not explicitly in here and something that people are really talking about with regards to max pressure control, but it's also something that haven't gotten to yet. And then there's also the other issue of what do we do with other intersection users like public transit signal priority, pedestrians, those aren't considered in, the standard, in, in this max pressure control. So what I've been trying to do is resolve some of these issues while retaining the theoretical properties of max pressure control, um, the maximum throughput properties. And, and so in doing so, I hope to make this more amenable to actually deploying this in practice um, while keeping the nice properties. So here's some of the goals that I want to have. Um, want to satisfy typical like practical engineering concerns with max stretch control while retaining this property that we had before where we had maximum throughput. And I also just want to evaluate how well it works at actual intersections because trying to get this into practice involves showing people that this is uh, has numerical advantages in, in performance compared to what's currently being done. Obviously the mathematical properties are nice, but we want to see that translate into numerical uh, benefits. So the first thing I want to do is talk about a um, project with one of my students, McHC students, to, um, he's been doing work on transit signal priority. And the idea here is that many cities, including parts of downtown, have these lanes reserved for buses with transit signal priority, meaning that when a bus shows up at the intersection, it gets a green light. Even uh, it, it gets priority, the light changes green for that bus to improve the bus travel times. And it's not immediately obvious how to put this into max pressure control. Max pressure control, of course, has this kind of maximization function of choosing the signal timing, which doesn't necessarily um, lend itself to bus signal priority. So what we did was we introduced a, um, bus lanes as a separate link in a network. So the blue here, that's the standard links of the network, the roads that you and I drive on, but the orange are the bus links. These are links that only buses can use and the buses will drive on these. And when a bus arrives, you want the bus to get a green light first. So you can see that there are orange links on some of the roads, but not all of them, because usually the bus links are only on lanes where buses would actually be. So maybe we don't have a bus on these minor roads, but we have a bus on these major roads. So this is kind of the structure of the network, and it's an accurate representation because normally the buses would be on separate lanes, so here we've drawn them with separate links um, to represent those separate lanes. And we can, we can consider a similar queuing model what we had before, except now we have it split into two components. So this is essentially the same thing we saw before, but now there's a bus version and a pedestrian or a private vehicle version. And these are quite like identical, right? It's not really that there's anything different here. It's just that we keep track of the buses and private vehicles separately. And then from there, it's the same Markov chain we had before. And from there, what it can do is figure out the strategy signal priority. So first we can define how many vehicles move across the intersection. And that's the minimum of the vehicles that are waiting and capacity times, whether the light is red or green. Same thing we had before, but now we add a constraint that if there are buses waiting, one of these buses must get a green light. If there are multiple buses waiting, well, we might not be able to give both of them a green light, but we can at least give one a green light. That's a requirement in our control now. Okay, so now we have the same kind of max pressure control where we're trying to maximize this objective function. And well, you know, we, we, want to, we obviously want to prove that it works, but we also have this additional constraint that if a bus is waiting, it, it, one of the buses will get a green light. So this is our new signal control. Well, 
Now we have to look at, does this satisfy our maximum throughput property that we care about in terms of getting vehicles through the network as, as much as possible? And indeed, we are able to prove that it does. Using the same kind of, um, the same kind of approach that we did before, we showed that if we define some uh, stable region demand, and we show that if this demand is not in the stable region, then it's impossible to stabilize by any signal control. If the demand is in the stable region, then a max pressure policy stabilizes it. Um, and that is equivalent to showing that this max pressure control can serve as much demand as any other signal control. Um, to do this, we use a Lyapunov function of the QLM squared. That was also a fairly standard one. Um, but, and so we end up with the result that we get maximum throughput for among all traffic signals that also have um, signal priority. So to test this, To found some data from Austin, Texas, um, data that I used during my PhD. And he found that there are also um, bus, uh, bus lanes and transit priority among certain roads, which he's drawn here and kind of illustrated um, from the bus routes that they obtained on Austin. The network itself is quite large, like a thousand links. Um, the demand is about 62,000 vehicles over two hours. And this is also real data. It was obtained by the Network Modeling Center at the University of Texas at Austin and calibrated to match their observations in 2011. So this is a real network that they used for practical projects for the city of Austin. And here's what some results that we get from this. Now, first, I want to show a demonstration of the queue length or an average total number of vehicles in the network with respect to time. And this is just kind of illustration of what stability means. So the blue line shows a stable demand uh, and you can see that it increases and then kind of stays roughly around the same uh, bound. It's going to go up and down due to stochasticity, but it stays roughly um, around the same value. Whereas the orange is an unstable condition and you can see that it increases and it just kind of has an increasing trend up to uh, uh, with time. Whereas sometimes it decreases, sometimes it's increasing, but overall it's not bounded. And so that kind of goes back to what we were talking about before where the definition of stability is that the Q lengths are bounded. So this is an example of a bounded Q length and this is an example of one that's not bounded and therefore unstable. So in other words, for this blue line, we are serving all the vehicles. For this orange line, we are not. They are getting, they are entering the network and just getting into a traffic jam somewhere in the network. Now we can look at comparing max pressure signal timings with the current fixed time signal timings. And I want to illustrate, so there are different, um, two different versions that, that Tua did here. Um, the, these three the, are fixed time and these three are a max pressure policy. These are um, with different demands or how much demand we're putting in per hour. Um, so you can see we tried it with six to 8,000 vehicles per hour. And of course, as we put more vehicles, more vehicle demand in there, the average number of waiting vehicles is going to increase. But you can see that the fixed time tends to have higher numbers of vehicles in the network than the max pressure. So we're getting more throughput through than, than the current signal timings. Um, looking at the average bus times, those are also improved by the max pressure policy. So this is the max pressure with transit signal priority. That's this blue line right here. And that may, gives us the best bus travel times. If we do max pressure without transit signal priority, it's this blue line here, which is not nearly as good. Now, if we do transit signal priority with current fixed timings, we're going to do better than max pressure without transit signal priority. So that's not surprising. And that kind of shows us why we need transit signal priority in the max pressure control. But definitely this is a lot better than, um, this is still better than fixed time bus priority or even with fixed time, no transit signal priority. So we're making improvements here in the bus travel times. Um, and that's kind of shows that we can get these buses through the network using the same max pressure stru structure. Now, I wanna talk about another practical issue which kind of mentioned, which was the issue of choosing phases in arbitrary order and lack of a maximum waiting time where you might be at this intersection and waiting for a very long time, especially if you're from a low demand approach. And um, looking at this, this was a paper I did with a couple undergraduate students, Jeffrey Hu and Michael O'Dell. Um, and I think it's really important for trying to get this onto roads in terms of making it practically um, accessible for, for traffic engineers. And the way, I chose to approach this was by enforcing a signal cycle, meaning that phases have to be selected in an order that's predetermined, kind of like what we have for signal cycles right um, today, where 
phases are selected in a certain order. Now the timings of each phase can be varied and the cycle length itself can be varied based on the timings of each phase. Um, there's a maximum cycle length, but we can vary the timings of a phase according to the pressure. However, we have to choose phases in a certain, in a certain order. And what that means is that if I'm looking at trying to choose the phase at time t, I can choose the phase at time t minus one, you know, keep the current phase active, or I can choose the next phase in the cycle. But that gives me only two choices when I'm trying to look at the phase, uh, wh which phase I want to get to next. Um, there's also a cycle duration where we can't have a signal cycle that's an hour long. We have to enforce some limitation on how long the cycle can be or how long it'll take to cycle back to the first phase. And to do that, we just add a variable that tracks the cycle length. And um, if we, uh, we can see like if we are choosing the first phase or if we go, if we go from the last phase to the first phase, we just set the cycle length. Otherwise we just add one to it. And we add a constraint that this cycle variable is less or equal to some maximum value that we can um, determine. Now we have a lost time, um, you know, standard traffic signal timing. There's a lost time per phase. And that's something that we considered as well. Um, looking at this, we have the same sort of stable region kind of approach where I want to describe what set of demands can be served by any traffic signal timing, but it here becomes harder because every phase has to be activated at least one time step. And as we go through the signal cycle, we're going to activate the phases more. Um, so we end up not having the same flexibility that we would if we completely ignored a signal cycle. Of course, that's good because for drivers, they want a signal cycle usually. So what we do is we say, what's a, let's find a lambda variable, which is the proportion of time that each phase is activated. And we have the convex combination requirement that the sum of the lambdas is equal to one, in other words, the, if we add the proportion of times for each phase, that adds up to one, right? And there's also some lower and upper bounds that we can give because each phase has to be activated at least once per cycle. So the lambda is greater or equal to one over the cycle length because it's activated once per cycle, which means that the year is an upper bound based on requiring or having to activate the other phases um, a certain amount. So this gives us the lower and upper bounds on that lambda. And the stable region, um, is based on these lambda values. So when we put these lower and upper bounds, we're essentially restricting the stable region, which is desired, but that also says that we're comparing this control to other controls like it, instead of comparing it to any control. We're comparing it, this control to other controls that also follow a signal cycle. Um, I want to point out that if I have any phase sequence, I can relate that to um, lambda values just by looking at the average amount of time that a phase is activated. And this is something that I proved. Um, in other words, if I, I can also separate this and look at it per cycle length. So that instead of looking at a long time horizon, I can look at each cycle separately. And that's going to be useful later on. It's very related, but I'll, I'll show you why that's useful later on. But the first thing to start off with is again, the proof that if I, demand is outside the stable region, can't say, we can't stabilize the network. This gives us an upper bound on how much demand can be served. And we're going to try to achieve that bound using max pressure control. So um, we again have the same max pressure weight function where we're trying to move vehicles from long queues to short queues. And looking at this max pressure control, we want to choose certain phases over the next time, the next tau time steps to maximize this function. So before all we had was this sum, and now we've added another sum that's looking into the future over the next tau time steps. The reason we added that is because I need to get the um, I need to get the signal timing to match some average that's going to be sufficient to serve the demand, and I can't do that at the next time step. I can't because there's a signal cycle constraint requiring me to activate certain phases. But if I look at a long time horizon, I will be able to achieve some lambda value, whatever average proportion I want of the cycle activation or, or of a phase activation, I can achieve that over a sufficiently long time horizon. And so that one over tau here is that time horizon. And I'm looking at the average signal activation over this time horizon of tau. Okay, so and now at this point, um, there's actually a really nice result that we can get, which is that if I look at the um, the signal um, so selection, um, if I taking the best max pressure signal cycle, and I'm doing this over 
the cycle length. So this is just a cycle length for a node. That in itself is actually sufficient to give me um, the average signal control I need. So in other words, on this previous slide, I had some tau time horizon. And I have now figured out that that time horizon is the cycle length. So I only have to look cycle length into the future instead of looking, say, two hours into the future. Um, and then we have the typical proof of maximum throughput. Um, same idea with the optimal function. We've gone through that before. Um, and then we can look at this um, in terms of numerical results. So I use the same network as we did for the previous result. Um, my, I had this undergraduate student um, from Clear Science who was really good and he, he um, implemented this in, my, um, in software. Um, and now we can compare what the stability looks like. So this is the stability with no cycle length. This is the first control we talked about, Varia's max pressure control. Um, and then this is the max pressure control with a cycle length. So you can see that it's not going to be as stable here. Using the same demands, sometimes it's unstable, sometimes it's stable. And that's expected because we've imposed a constraint that we have to activate a phase once per cycle. So the stable region demand or the demand we can stabilize is not going to be as large as we could if we don't have a cycle. But that's okay because we're trying to make this practically accessible. Um, why did it? Uh, that's weird. Okay. <laughs> um, this is a comparison of travel times. Um, and this is the blue lines with the no cycle length. The orange is a cycle length of, with this max pressure cycle control. And the green is a previous paper from 2015 that had a different cyclical max pressure control structure. So the approach that I'm taking is better than that one. Um, and it's not as good as having no signal cycle, but it's not, not super bad either. Um, looking at the red light duration for the worst performing turns, um, what this shows is that using Varia's signal control with no cycle, like no um, cycle at all, we see that there are sometimes very long red light waiting times, um, where if some people are waiting more than 400 seconds for to get a green light, which is kind of ridiculous, right? And with the orange, um, which is what I developed, we reduce that as much as we want um, based on, you know, if we have a cycle of 225 seconds, then that will be kind of the bound on how long it takes to get a green light. Um, using uh, Lee Al's um, control, we see similar effects, except sometimes he gets a really bad worst case there. Um, so this kind of just illustrates the practical benefits of this control. Now, I took this and I had a project with Hennepin County. I'm trying to make this actually put, actually put this on Minnesota roads because so far this is nice in theory, but we want to see this actually benefit people. And to do this project, this project involved um, the cycle, the, the, the cyclical max pressure control structure, but it also involved a simulation component where I wanted to, to demonstrate to Hennepin County that this is beneficial. Um, and so to do that, um, I partnered with another one of my graduate students, Samantha Barman. And we conducted very detailed micro simulation studies of max pressure control in, um, in seven intersections across two corridors. These intersections were chosen in partnership with Hennepin County engineers. Um, and they gave us a lot of data for these intersections. Um, they gave us the current signal timings. They gave us 15 minute traffic counts. Basically they gave us everything that they give that their traffic engineers use to determine signal timings. And they gave that to us so we could implement this in simulation, create a very accurate uh, model. This is not, not just we have 15 minute traffic counts, we have that for I think six different demand periods over the day. So we have like morning peak, um, midday peak, we have off peak periods, we have afternoon peaks. There's a lot of different periods that we analyze this for. And what we did was you just compared the different max pressure signal timings to what they currently have, just to see like how it would perform. And here are the results. Um, now I know these numbers are quite small to read and I'm not going to ask you to read all the numbers. Indeed, there are a lot of them, but I put this up here just to kind of illustrate how many different scenarios that Samantha was actually able to evaluate here. Each of these different boxes is a scenario that was evaluated with simulation. Um, now the, the key thing I want to pay attention to is the heat map. The red means that the throughput decreased, the green means that that throughput increased. So for each of these each of these horizontal rows, we have 
it, each of these horizontal rows is a different intersection. Each of the columns is a different time period. So like AM peak, PM peak, AM off peak, PM off peak. And what this shows is that um, for each of these, we can kind of get some uh, a max pressure control parameters that achieve a little, maybe a little bit more throughput, maybe about the same throughput as current signal timings, which is actually a little bit surprising that we didn't see more throughput improvements, but I guess the current signal timings were well-timed in terms of throughput. Um, so like you're looking at any of these boxes, the 0% is the baseline. This next column, AMP is acyclic max pressure control, it's varieties. And then we have several different versions of the cyclic max pressure control with different cycle lengths. And some of the boxes have a lot of red numbers, some of a lot of green numbers, but overall the numbers are quite small. We're not seeing huge changes um, in the throughput either way. Like some of the numbers are like 2% in e each direction. So that didn't change a lot. And here's the other three intersections. We tried some intersections. So you can kind of see it. We didn't see a whole lot of changes in throughput, which is a little bit surprising, but we saw really, really good changes in delays. So looking at how long people wait at the intersection, this is the same kind of heat map, the green, means an improvement in delay. So like uh, reduction in 50%, here's that bound. And then here, red is an increase in delay. Um, and you can see that for all of the, pretty much every intersection, we are able to find some max pressure setting that reduces delay by a lot. Like some of the numbers here are like 50% reductions in delay. And part of the reason for this is that the max pressure control, as you saw before, is responsive to Q lengths. So when a Q length is high, the max pressure control tries to activate that phase which helps reduce the delay because we're, give, we're reducing the waiting time of, of long queues. So we get to the long queue to move forward that reduces the delay of all those vehicles in that queue. Um, and here's the same results for the other three intersections. So in summary, max pressure control seems to perform fairly well in practice. Um, throughput doesn't seem to change very much, but delay increase or, or reduces quite a lot. Um, we did some other uh, analyses like looking at the throughput with the best parameters. Um, you can see that these are roughly the same um, for these different intersections. Um, but if you look at the delay, and especially you want to look at the green and the red, which is the um, different version of max pressure control, we can see that the delay is um, oftentimes um, improved. Or even with if the orange with the variety max pressure control, it's even more improved compared with the current uh, um, fixed timing or the current adapt actuate coordinated signal control, which is in blue. So we're doing better in delay here. Um, now, the final question I want to resolve is how does max pressure control affect food choice? So looking at these previous results, they look nice. Like we have good performance in practice and we've resolved some practical issues that people would be concerned by. However, it's well known that people change their route choices based on travel times. When you open Google Maps, um, you probably try to get on the shortest travel time route. And as we reduce the delays here, as we make the delays smaller, we are changing the travel times, which means that these signal timings are actually going to affect the route choices. Now you might wonder, okay, why is that important? Well, a lot, these max pressure control is trying to and get people through the network. And so we're wondering that if people change their routes, maybe there are more people driving on, on Highway 55 than there were before. Well, now the demand is higher. And so we might see that actually max pressure control is not really improving things all that much just because of route choices. Maybe it might even make things worse because of route choices. And there are papers in the literature that show that you could change the signal timings and make traffic worse for everyone just because of these route choices where everyone's trying to get on their best route for themselves. Um, this is known as user equilibrium route choice if you've um, studied it, uh, net traffic network modeling. And it's something that we usually take into account when looking at city level um, traffic control or network design. Like if we're building a road, we have to consider how that's going to affect route choices and traffic congestion. Um, now, we weren't able to treat this with the same theoretical properties as you did before, but what we did with my PhD student, Rongsheng Chen, was trying to look at, okay, how does max pressure control affect route choice and traffic congestion in a realistic city network? So here we have the same max pressure control again, where we're just saying, okay, the weight function move vehicles from long queues to short queues. But what I want to highlight here is that this weight, this pressure function I've been looking at depends on the turning proportions. It assumes that the turning proportions are fixed for max pressure control. In reality, 
they're not going to be fixed as people change their roots. Um, but it also shows that max pressure control depends on these turn proportions. So as they change, the root, the max pressure control itself is going to change as well. Um, and of course, the turn proportions affect the coolants because it affects how vehicles go through the network, which also affects the max pressure control. So in other words, the root choices here are going to affect the travel times because they affect the max, how the max pressure control um, determines the signal timings. If there are um, different turning proportions or different queue lengths, we end up with different signals timings being activated. But the travel times will also affect the root choices in the opposite direction. And so we have this kind of feedback cycle where you want to see like root choices affect travel times, which affect root choices. We want to find a mutually consistent solution. In other words, an equilibrium where the root choices and travel times are consistent in a way that they will both be a solution to their respective problems. So in other words, since drivers choose routes to minimize their own travel times, we need to find an easier equilibrium root choice. Um, we can formally define this quite easily where no driver can reduce their travel times by changing routes. This is a standard definition. Actually solving for this is not nearly as easy, um, but it's a standard definition where either no one is using the path or the path has a minimum travel time. So you can kind of think of it as like, um, you're not going to take a path that is high, has very high travel time. You want to take a path that's good for you. And if the path has a very high travel time or indeed higher than other paths, you aren't going to use it. Um, there's a very famous paper from Michael Smith back from 1979, 1980s, that shows that signal timing can actually make the um, route choice um, cause a lot of traffic congestion. And so we end up, if we look at how this might affect um, max pressure control, we're well, looking at the stable region of demand, we have certain equations that defined it as we discussed before. And one of those equations is just based on calculating what are the link volumes, how many vehicles are trying to use certain roads. And those, that of course depends on a route choice, which it comes down to our turning proportion variable, which is how re route choice is represented. What this means is that as route choice changes, we could take some demand um, some entering vehicles, like people are entering from neighborhoods or entering from office buildings or apartment buildings and driving to other places. We could take that demand and change the route choices enough that the demand that was previously stable becomes unstable because of the route choice changes. And mathematically, you can see that, that it, would, it would change the route choice in this function that defines our set of stable reach, our, our stable region of demand. And we, we can see that it would possibly cause the demand to um, get outside of the set. And that's what we're really looking for here is trying to see like with max pressure control affecting root choices, is that going to cause extra congestion that makes it less useful on cities? Well, so here's a question, how much does max user equilibrium affect these improvements from max pressure control? And we aren't really able to answer this analytically, but we can answer this by solving for user equilibrium in a city network and just trying to see, well, what does the resulting traffic um, look like? What are the travel times versus traffic congestion? So again, using the same network that I had before, because I have good data for this network, <laughs> um, we used a comp kind of like a complicated procedure to find user equilibrium. Um, the way we did that was, well, we start at, at, with an iteration by calculating the turning proportions for current route choice. We calculate our max pressure control, essentially doing a simulation of the vehicles and of the max pressure signal timings to just see what are the throughputs, what are travel times, where are vehicles going based on our max pressure signal timings. After that, we calculate the new shortest paths based on the travel times, and we update the path, um, the shortest paths. And then we'll go back to the start and say, okay, we want to move some of the vehicles onto our shortest path. Now, if, if you've studied traffic assignments, you'll recognize that this is basically a standard um, method of successive averages approach to solving traffic assignment. The only real difference here is that we're using max pressure signal timing in our calculation of travel times, which means that we have, um, you know, we have a dynamic network loading model, we have a simulation model there. And so it's a little bit more complicated in how we calculate travel times. Um, and now I want to show that we did indeed find user equilibrium. These show the um, gap. The gap is the difference between the actual travel times and the shortest path travel time. So in other words, if the gap is zero, the travel times that are experienced is equal to the shortest path travel times. And we have found user equilibrium. Everyone is on the shortest path for themselves. So looking at this gap versus iteration, we have plotted the, um, the gap for different demands. And we can see that for the most part, 
they're going to converge. I mean, some of them kind of get stuck, which is normal for dynamic traffic assignment. But for the most part, they start out high with a, uh, with a high gap, and then it quickly reduces, and then kind of gets pretty close to zero. So overall, it looks pretty good in terms of convergence. So we are finding user equilibrium here. And now we can ask the question of, what's the, what are the average travel times with max pressure control compared to current signal timings? Um, and they look very good. Um, here's the average travel time with respect to demand. The blue line is a max pressure. The orange is the fixed time. So you can see that as demand increases with the fixed with our current signal timings, the travel times increase quite a lot. And with max pressure, they increase only slightly. So max pressure by trying to maximize throughput is actually being very responsive to the increase in demand that we're putting through the network and getting vehicles through the network even as demand gets a lot higher. Um, here's another graph that shows the total queue length. The blue line is um, you know, some is a demand at iteration one, and then the other lines are the demands at um, iteration three, 10, 30, or 69. And these are pretty much about the same. The point of this graph is to show that if we look at how max pressure converges to equilibrium, it actually seems to be helping in, in terms of getting throughput. So if we look at iteration one, where vehicles are we vehicles aren't really on good paths. There's very high queue lengths, but as vehicles start to get to an equilibrium where they're on the shortest paths for themselves, we see that the queue lengths quite uh, they stabilize, which means that we're getting every vehicle through the network in a timely fashion. So, looking at this, I want to. To, um, right, to say, say some conclusions and then give you some time to answer questions. So the main conclusion here um, is that max pressure control has valuable mathematically proven properties, um, especially maximizing throughput through a whole city, which is a really nice property to have. Um, and it's also decentralized, so very easy to compute. So in other words, this is something that it would be really nice if this was used in practice. And I think it would have some a lot of benefits for overall city throughput. and um, it seems that it would um, be quite easy to implement computationally. Um, we have these properties proven for a Markov chain model, um, but we have extended the Markov chain model and the signal timings that we consider um, with some practical considerations to try to make this more amenable to practical use. Um, for instance, if I add, I add the transit signal priority and I added a cyclical phase structure, we still obtained the maximum throughput property and decentralized property. So we can do max pressure control with practical, be practical behaviors um, while still getting those nice mathematical properties. Um, and I, of course, wanted to compare this on actual networks just to see how this works. I mean, obviously, math, the math looks great, but reality is complicated and messy. So we want to see how this works. But fortunately, it seems to work very well. We looked at Hennepin County, um, seven intersections, very detailed micro simulation, and it, it, max pressure control performed very well in delays. We looked at the downtown Austin network and we looked at it with root choice, um, user equilibrium root choice, and max pressure control again performs better than, than what's currently there. Um, so here's what I want to do in the future. Um, I want to keep continue extending this for more practical considerations some of these include signal coordination pedestrian crosswalk activation those just haven't been treated yet in the literature um max fresh control is quite new since it was first from 2013 but it's something that that is possible to do um it's also helpful to have a more accurate traffic flow model other people have started to pick up the max pressure control work as well um this is from Saif Jabari he was actually interviewing here <laughs> a few years ago and um he has been working on this as well um he, he introduced a more accurate traffic flow model which I have been working on with um with one of my PhD students um, and I also want to get towards a demonstration in practice, meaning, okay, we did this in simulation, can we actually do this on, a, on an actual road in Minnesota and see how it works, and hopefully that will get us towards um, doing this in practice on a larger scale and improving traffic. Um, to do, towards doing that, I have a um, project with Raphael Stern. Um, it's a phase, it's kind of an extension of my previous project with Hennepin County, where we're trying to um, put this on actual signal hardware. And then eventually in a phase three, we will hopefully put this on um, Minnesota roads in a few intersections and see how it performs. Um, finally, I think this max pressure control um, approach 
this methodology can be applied to other transportation problems. Some of the problems I've been applying it to are autonomous intersection control and also right, the dispatch of ride-sharing vehicles like Uber Lyft vehicles. And so I have some papers on that, also have an NSF project looking at um, how to extend this to other problems. Um, so those are kind of some of the things I'm working on with respect to this topic. Um, I just want to illustrate that Vinayak Dixit, who's my collaborator in Sydney, Australia, actually implemented some kind of max pressure controller. Um, he designed his own single control and, and implemented it in Indonesia and India. We have a paper out in PLOS One and it seemed to perform quite well. Um, so in summary, I would like to thank everyone who helped me with this research, my graduate students, my undergraduate students, as well as my, um, my funding agencies. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I think we got a few minutes for questions here. Let me just uh, make a comment here first, and that uh, Saif Javari actually got his PhD from this program as well here a few years ago. All right, so uh, any questions for Michael? Hi, Michael, thank you. Uh, I had a question about this idea of moving vehicles seems like a noble idea, but what if I wanted to change my objective and move people? Um, so that might prioritize, I mean, certainly buses can be prioritized, but I can envision a scenario where I have like three vehicles, each with one driver, but then I, and that, that route would be prioritized over like a carpool vehicle with four or five or six people who really should probably be given priority because it has more people. So how might that be done? Or a flip question could be, I'm interested in air quality impacts. So I might want to prioritize maybe the internal combustion vehicle movement over electric because then I'd have less emissions or maybe the opposite to encourage more people to buy electric. <laughs> anyway. How would these alternative objectives be incorporated into this analysis? It seems like maybe cameras would need to be involved, but anyway. Yeah, so I think one of the uh, two questions in that involves how do we detect, like, so looking at the vehicles of different passengers, part of it involves detecting how many passengers in a vehicle. If they're separated in different lanes, that makes it detection fairly easy. And so we could, for instance, um, if we can get the coolants in different lanes, you can get the coolants of vehicles of different passenger counts. And I think we could do something similar. The, the complicated part is as we move vehicles, we're moving passenger. If we track the passenger coolants, we have to move multiple passengers per vehicle. And so depending on what assumptions you make, it might make the math a little bit messy in terms of when we move vehicles, how many passengers get moved. But I think it's possible. In terms of air quality, uh, this is a sort of thing where like, the objective here is maximizing throughput. And we saw that there were really nice benefits for delay, but it, the objective wasn't, maxim, it wasn't to minimize delay. And one of my undergraduate students actually, um, Jake Grabenolt, was looking at how, um, how the max pressure control would affect air quality or emissions. Um, so it's the kind of thing where I suspect it has an impact, where Jake's um, experiments and simulation seem to show that it has a really good impact, but it's not clear that I can just change the objective because the objective is very carefully tailored to get a proof of maximum um, throughput in a markup chain model. So it's not as easy to just get a proof of maximum or minimum emissions. So Mike, I have a question. So is, uh, I understand that uh, you, in order for your method to be optimized, you need to know where, where people will go to mm -hmm. some extent. So you introduce uh, some randomness but at the same time, uh, there are some prescribed average that should be satisfied. So I'm wondering, uh, have you tried to implement some uh, roadblocks or some situation like a big event uh, that will completely disrupt uh, what the algorithm has been optimized to? Um, whether there is value to test whether this maximum pressure control will uh, not fail miserably. Like, because I, I assume that in some situation, uh, you want something that maybe is not optimized, but will still work, will not cause a, a, a massive traffic jam. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. Mathematically, what you're saying is that due to some events like Super Bowl or some similar disruption, the training proportions have changed um, drastically here. Um, and because this model uses the average training proportions, if the averages are no longer accurate, we definitely get inaccurate results. Um, and then we would end up with losing the, 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 the proof of maximum throughput. However, there are versions of max pressure control that don't require using the turning proportions in the pressure function and still achieve maximum throughput. Um, it looks like Xi minus Xj instead of Xij minus Xjk. Um, so 
there are, I think there are ways to deal with that. Definitely a, a good consideration. I, yeah, um, great job, Michael. Um, I have a couple of questions if you have time. Uh, the first um, question is that you have this um, dynamical system and you have a control function. I'd like to know about how you solve that problem. Do you, do, do you use myopic policy? Do you have approximation, exact algorithm or something? Yeah, it's actually, so it's essentially formulated as Markov decision process, but we're proposing a specific control policy. And so the Markov decision process under a specific policy relaxes your Markov chain. And then the question is, okay, how are we solving it? Well, we aren't actually solving it in a sense of trying to minimize the objective. What we're doing is showing that this policy and the Markov chain associated with this policy have a really nice positive recurrence like property. Okay. So that's kind of, it's a kind of like an analytical proof. Right, uh, okay, good. Um, the other question that I have is that uh, on Hennepin County Road, uh, I think this is a really interesting finding. I mean, this can be um, something that, uh, if you don't mind going to that slide. Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so you don't get a lot of throughput improvement, but you get really good delay. I mean, decrease in the delay. Um, I guess the point maybe that I mean, I'd like you to elaborate on that. When we look at the a long period of time, the throughput may be the same because we have the same demand and at the end of the day, everyone gets to home to their destination. Okay. But if you look at the small time intervals, five minute time interval, throughput may be different, right? Um, but the, the good thing is that the delay has decreased. I'd like you if you could elaborate on that. You know, you, you just say that your objective is to maximize the throughput but the throughput is not really decre uh, increased by the delay has decreased. Yeah, I, I think I think you might be right in, in what you're saying there, where um, if we, since we're looking at a time period that's fairly long, long enough, like maybe like an hour or two, um, it's long enough for most of the vehicles to get through, like the demand is high and then it kind of reduces during the peak period as, as fewer people enter. And so maybe we're getting everyone through during that time period, but, max pressure control is getting people through faster. And so the delay is reduced, even though the throughput, if we look at that overall time period might be the same. And maybe if we just looked at a slice of that time period, we'd see better throughput up to that point. I don't think we looked at that actually, but it's a good, it's a good point to look at and a good explanation. Okay, I think we have a couple uh, remote questions. What's that? You'll have to, okay. Uh, this is a question from Kathy French. If you go back to the first slide with the blue cars and the single orange car, uh -huh. my experience is that the orange car would choose to turn right and get into the intersection. So the blue cars can never move forward. That's her experience with a commute in downtown Minneapolis. <laughs> how, how do you take into account people turning into congestion in the model? Could this be the reason why your model in Hennepin County, you had a case with 250% increase in wait time? And was that a situation where the priority was given to a vehicle that would turn into congestion? Yeah, so a couple of, of, of questions there. That's, that's a great question. Um, looking at this vehicle behavior, um, so we're kind of assuming that the average turning proportions are known. And so in this case, I just kind of for, said the tur it's turning a certain direction, um, but definitely I could see people change their route choice based on the conditions around them. And that's something I was trying to get at with the route choice effect, but you know, it, there's definitely more room to look at how people change their routes dynamically. Um, so that's definitely a possibility. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm not sure how well the Markov chain model is capturing behavior. I'll, I'll, I think it depends on just how we're, um, how accurate we're modeling things like that, that sort of behavior. Um, I do want to comment on the, the uh, results that you mentioned a 250% increase. And I know it's going to take a little bit of time to get jump through to that slide, but I think it's an important point to comment on that I didn't really get into the, um, the results that much because of lack of time 
But I want to point out that these results are based on different parameters. And one of the key parameters here is the duration of the time step, five seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds, 20 seconds. If the time step is very small, we can change phases more frequently, um, which is good when demand is low. If the time step is higher, though, we change phases um, less frequently, which means less lost time as a proportion of cycle length. And so I think when we're seeing this really bad um, uh, uh, delay increases for this particular intersection what's really happening is that our time step is just actually really small and so we're we're shuffling phases a lot and ending up with um just just maybe this intersection it just has like um roughly equal demand for two conflicting approaches like north south and east west have a roughly equal demand and so it's actually like shuffling the phases very frequently incurring a lot of lost time and so a lot of the the delay is high just because we aren't being very efficient there with the parameters. Um, but if you if you use different parameters, we'll see different changes in um, delay. Another question from Randall Barnes. I can kind of envision how the proof might work, but it seems as though you are assuming that the external demands loads are stationary. What happens when the external loads on the network is not stationary? for example, in response to an accident on some link? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the external, so in terms of internal versus external demand, um, there's the question of what boundary we set, right? And I think for an accident on a, on a road, or um, that would be an internal capacity reduction, but it wouldn't actually change the external demand in terms of vehicles entering from like a neighborhood or an apartment building or an office building. But definitely we are assuming that the demands are stationary in this uh, uh, in this effect. And that's kind of a issue we would have to um, figure out. I think the, the max pressure control, the proof does not actually depend on knowing the demands. So yes, we're assuming demands are stationary, but the control in theory should work for any demand that can be stabilized. So what's really changing, what's really going to be changing are the um, turning proportions for different periods. And so that that's the thing I'm more worried about in terms of being non-stationary. Okay, this is interesting stuff, but I think we're just about out of time. So why don't we give Michael a hand here and uh, wish him well, okay, in the future. <laughs>